I'm uh, Nigel Lang, originally from Scotland. I've only been in Australia for 35 years, so excuse my accent. So what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, muscle diseases and work we're doing here in the Perkins on muscle diseases. So skeletal muscle is what allows us to move uh, when we want to. And not all of us can move as well as this guy. I try, but I just don't seem to be able to keep up with him. And so how do we move? How many of you have asked yourselves that question? Apparently, I asked my mum at the age of three how I can do that. How can I move my finger when I want to? So you could say that I've been sort of doomed to work on muscles since the age of three. <laughs> All right, so there are five major components in allowing us to move. So it's our brain in our head, the spinal cord in our vertebral column in our back, the peripheral nerve, so the nerve that connects the spinal cord out to the muscle in the limb, the nerve muscle junction, and the muscle itself. And the muscle is the last part in that puzzle, and that's uh, what we'll be talking about today. I love when my Mac talks gets converted to PC, and we now go one, two, three, one, one. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Everyone should use Max. And this is just a little diagram of uh, the spinal cord here and the nerve running out from uh, the spinal cord into the limb and hitting the muscle. And that's what the connection there makes uh, the muscle move. And I think this is a, a thing of beauty this is uh, the peripheral nerve coming down. It's stained green onto the muscle. You can see the muscle fibers in the background. And where the nerve fiber uh, hits the muscle fiber, there's this sort of red hand grasping each muscle fiber. And in each of the little fingers of that hand, there's a thin green uh, nerve twiglet. I said to my wife that we should have this made into a huge picture and stuck up in the lounge, but she didn't want that. <laughs> All right. So muscle under the microscope. So when you look at muscle, and this is what the, path the, the pathologists do, they look at the muscle in longitudinal section. So these are the muscle fibers here with nuclei on the edges. And this is it in transverse section. So this is cut across. And the easiest way to think about muscle is that every time you eat a steak or a chicken muscle or whatever, that's what you're eating. You're eating muscle. All right? So when you next cut your steak in, across, think that the pathologist does that at a sort of higher magnification. All right, so there are two main types of muscle diseases. There are the muscular dystrophies. And muscular dystrophies are characterized by the death of the muscle fibers. So the muscle fibers just die and disappear, and they're replaced by fat. And uh, dystrophy comes from two words, two Greek words, dys meaning bad and troph meaning nourishment. So people used to think that uh, muscular dystrophies arose because uh, the muscles weren't getting enough nourishment. We know that that isn't the case now. But if you look at... Uh, the muscle of a patient with muscular dystrophy. This is normal muscle here with nice pink, healthy muscle fibers. This is the muscle in a patient with muscular dystrophy. And you can see that the muscle fibers have basically disappeared and the ones that are left are extremely abnormal. And obviously this cannot contract anymore. And that's why the kids with muscular dystrophies can't move. They lose their muscle fibers so there's nothing there left to contract. The other group of uh, muscle diseases are called myopathies. And my, these myopathies are frequently called congenital myopathies, which means that they're present at birth. So as soon as the baby is born, they're affected by these diseases. And myopathies are characterized by muscle fiber dysfunction. So the muscle fibers don't die. The muscle fibers are all there, but they just don't work very well. And if you look at those uh, down the microscope, the muscle fibers are all there, but they look a bit abnormal. And the easiest one to see the abnormality is this disease called central core disease. 
So if you look at each of the muscle fibers, you can see there's a sort of pale area in the middle that's sort of been punched out like an apple corer. So the muscle fiber is there, but it's not working properly. Okay, so that's uh, a bit about how muscles look. Now, this is a video uh, we found once on the internet. We were never able to find it again. All right. Now, your heart is just, oops, this is really hard. Your heart is a muscle just like your skeletal muscle, and it contracts in the same way. So this is a video of your heart muscle contracting. So there's the heart beating. You go inside, and you can see you've got two sets of filaments which slide past each other. And as they slide past, that's how your muscle fibers contract. The white stuff coming in, the white dandruff is calcium, and there you have these little oarsmen, these nano oarsmen on their myers and thick filaments that grab hold of the thin filament and will row the thin filament past. And then it just relaxes and goes again. So when I contract my muscles, I think of these billions upon billions of little rowers in my muscle fibers, each rowing away to make my muscle fibers contract. So for the old ones amongst us, it's uh, uh, Charlton Heston in Ben-Hur, attached to his oar. For the younger ones, it's that Australian hunk in Les Miserables. Or, you know. All right. I could do with these lights up now. Yeah. Down the front. Do that. All right. So I was, I was walking through a supermarket one day with my wife, and I saw these. And you see, most people would see a, a, a bottle brush, right? What I saw was a muscle thick filament, right? Because if you take one of those and another one of those and stick them together, there you have a muscle thick filament, right? The barrier area in the middle and all these little nano oarsmen on each side. Right? So next time you're washing the dishes with one of these sort of scrubbing brushy things, think about your muscle fibers uh, contracting. Got that? All right. Okay. All right. The other side of, uh, thanks, John. The other side of muscle diseases is genetics. So the muscular dystrophies and the myopathies are genetic diseases, which means that they're caused by mutations in genes. And what my lab has been doing since the late 1980s is finding the genes which, when they're mutated, cause muscle diseases and others. And this is a human being's genetic makeup. So these are the chromosomes uh, spread out and stained red so that you can see them. So this is a person's entire genetic makeup looked at down a microscope. Another way to think about the, our entire genetic makeup is it's the human genome. And we have two pairs of chromosomes numbered from the largest one to the smallest 22, plus six chromosomes X and Y. Most men are XY, most women are XX, just occasionally it's the other way around for fun. And we get three billion base pairs from our mum and three billion base pairs from our dad. So that's six billion base pairs. And I once calculated how long it would take our departmental typist to type out six billion characters. And the answer is 34 years of nonstop typing. So that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 34 years to type out the equivalent of the human genome. This tells you two things. The human genome is quite big. And none of us in our lifetime will type out the equivalent of the human genome. And when we're trying to find a mutation in a gene that causes a genetic disease, we are basically then looking for one typographical error in 34 years of typing. And we do this all the time. OK. So in the old days, the way to find disease genes was you needed big families. And the wonderful thing about Australia is that people 
tended to emigrate here, stay here, because it's a great place. And then if someone came from, say, Scotland and brought a mutant gene with them, you know, somewhere back here, we've got this big family now, all descended from whoever that was. So Australia is, in fact, full of amazing families that allow us to find disease genes. So we've been able to do things here in Australia that other countries have found very hard to do. And so this family was one we started working with in 1989. Uh, it's from South Australia. And they have a dominant uh, myopathy. And it's dominant because half of the children, approximately, of an affected person also have the disease, and it's seen down through all the generations. And so this family was big enough on its own for us to track down where the gene, the disease gene was. And you do that by looking at markers throughout the genome and finding one that all the affected people in the family have and all the unaffected people in the family don't have. And so we did that, and we localized the disease gene to a region on chromosome 1, which is our biggest chromosome. So it lay between this point on the short arm of chromosome 1 and this point on the long arm of chromosome 1. And this was 27 million base pairs. So we'd narrowed down from you know, 3 billion to 27 million. We were getting closer. All right? So this was in the early 1990s. The human genome hadn't done its thing then. So we then spent three years on a particular task. Now, this is a genetic muscle disease. So the mutation is going to be in a gene that codes for a protein that does something in muscle, isn't it? It's not going to be a mutation in a gene that only does something in the liver or something that only does something in your big toe or whatever. It has to be a mutation in a muscle gene. So we spent three years localizing uh, muscle genes uh, on chromosome 1. And how you did that back then is you made a copy of that gene, you made it fluorescent, you hybridized it to one of those chromosome spreads I showed you before, and you looked for where the fluorescence came up on chromosome 1. And weirdly, we, start, we have started, this, the first one we looked at was here, it turned out to be way down the bottom, so it wasn't the gene, then that one, then that one, and then this one. And this was the first muscle gene that we showed was in our region where the disease gene had to be. And we sequenced that gene in the patients and we found a mutation. And so the mutation was in this tropomyosin. So this is your muscle thin filament again. And the tropomyosin is this blue rope that stretches along the length of the thin filament. We published that in 1995. And it took six years from hearing about the family to knowing what the answer was. All right? Okay. So, when we wrote this paper up, uh, we said at the end of the paper that other people in the world might be suffering from actin disease. Actin is the most important protein in the muscle thin filament. And I got hate mail from people around the world who'd spent their lives studying actin. And they said actin is such an important muscle protein that if any human being had a mutation in it, they would die in utero, right? They wouldn't be born, so you're never going to see this. And then I was at a meeting in Amsterdam in 1996, and this uh, wonderful neuropathologist from Germany, Hans Goebel, showed the muscle pathology from three children from around uh, Europe, two of whom had already died. But in their muscles, they had these pale areas. The muscle fibers should be uniformly green with this stain. They had these pale areas. And when you looked with the electron microscope, these pale areas were actin thin filaments. So this was like actin storage disease. These kids had too much actin. And I said, the mutations might be in the actin gene. And we were sent DNA from these uh, three patients. And my PhD student at the time, Kristen Nowak, sequenced the actin gene in the patients. And she walked into my office one day and said, I think I found something. 
Now, you've heard about eureka moments, right? Today is eureka. That's the word for today's you know, visit to the Perkins. So a eureka moment, to me, is instant enlightenment. You go from not knowing about something to instantly knowing the answer. You don't get, in my experience, many eureka moments in your career. Frequently, the answer gradually becomes clear. So if you're ever in Paris and in Louvre, there's a marble statue there called Nature Revealing Herself to Science. And it's this woman taking her clothes off. I, as I said to a, uh, one person one time, that's never seemed to work in my lab. You know? <laughs> that doesn't seem to be the way that my, work, uh, my lab works. Anyway, so Kristen said, I think I found something. And what she'd found was this. In two of the three patients, here's the normal sequence with this black color here, the G. Here's one of the patients, and the mutation is G to C, and the other patient, the mutation is G to T. So at exactly the same point in the actin gene, in two out of the three patients, there's a mutation. So think about that. Remember I said before, you're looking for one typographical error in 34 years of typing. Two out of these three patients, the typographical error was at exactly the same spot. That's extraordinary. Same pathology, mutation at the same spot. It had to be real. Right? So we went from not knowing actin disease to knowing actin disease in an, in an instant. All right. So over the years, we found a number of uh, uh, muscle disease genes. One of them, uh, luckily for me, is named after me, which is kind of cool. You know, to have a disease named after you is kind of cool. <laughs> it's quite useful for getting grant funding. <laughs> All right. So that was between 87 and 2013. We found that many uh, muscle disease genes. And in the last few years, we found a lot more. And the pace of finding disease genes has increased rapidly. And the reason for that is next generation sequencing. So when this new technology came in, in M block, just across the way there, we can sequence two people's entire genetic makeup in a day. Right? It's an astonishingly powerful technology. We can sequence every gene in two of you, if you want, uh, in a day. And so, there's been this group of diseases that I've wanted to get a handle on, again, since the early uh, in the mid-1990s. And these are the fetal achinesias. So these are recessive diseases where the muscle disease is so severe that the unborn baby becomes paralyzed, frequently as early as a, a sort of 20, 25, 28 weeks. And it's recessive because frequently the families in which this occur are consanguineous. That means that the parents are related to each other. And in the old days, there was just no way of uh, approaching these uh, families. We couldn't do anything to help them. And in 2011, we wrote a review of the, genetic, the then known genetic causes of the fetal achinesias, and we said, we're going to try and study these. And that was basically an advertisement, saying, we're going to try and do this. If you've got any cases, any DNA samples, send them to us, and we'll see what we can do. And it worked. People from all over the world sent us DNA samples here for us to analyze. And I'm just going to talk about uh, one of the genes that we found to illustrate how amazing the technology now is. So this is severe recessive fetal achinesia and hemolymopathy, and the gene turned out to be KLHL40. And we started with only three DNA samples. Uh, one from a West Australian family of Chinese ethnic origin where the parents were not related. So this uh, kid died just uh, before uh, birth. And two siblings from a consanguineous family from Turkey. So the mum and dad were related and they had two affected uh, babies. And what Gina Ravenscroft in my lab did was she did the next generation sequencing. She, she analyzed every gene 
in those three uh, babies. And she found mutations in those three babies in exactly the same gene, KLHL40. The West Australian family, where the parents were not related, as you would expect, she found two different mutations in the baby. And in the two uh, Turkish babies, she found homozygous, so that's two copies of the same mutation. So then we contacted, we, I've been in this business for so long, we've got this amazing uh, collection of friends and colleagues around the world that I call the Coalition of the Willing. And whenever any of us finds a hint of a new disease gene, we uh, email each other and say, have a look at your samples and see what you can find. So our colleagues around the world looked at 143 of these severe cases, and we found 19 different mutations in KLHL40 in 28 families, and that nailed it, basically. And we now know that mutations in this gene are the commonest cause of this phenotype across the entire world. And when we used a, a stain, an antibody for the, uh, the KLHL40 protein, what we showed is that these are two controls. It stains green in the muscle here, green there in the longitudinal sections, and basically the patients don't have any of that protein. So the protein's missing, and that's what's wrong with these kids. And that's why they become paralyzed before they're born. And when we first found mutations in KLHL40, it was only a number in the genome. Nobody knew what that protein did in muscle. And within about uh, 15 months, a group in Texas had shown exactly what that protein does. And so we've gone, again, from a state of ignorance to knowing uh, a lot more about how muscles work. All right, and this is the paper uh, that was published. There are 55 authors on this paper from 30 institutions on four continents, all coordinated from this building here. And it's a, I tell you, it's a great feeling. Yeah. Take home message. Really amazing research can be done here in this building in Western Australia by Western Australians. And the other thing is, it took 16 months from the DNA arriving from Turkey to getting the answer published. Yeah, the pace of what we can do now is amazing. Uh, for an old, an old person like me who remembers the old days, it's amazing what we can do now to what we could do uh, back then. All right. Doing what? Five minutes? God, you're tough. I got 30. Okay. John's tough. Erdirk. Erdirk is the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. And its number one goal is to know all the genes for human Mendelian monogenetic disorders by 2020. Right? Now, basically, the first human disease gene to be found by the new genetics was in 1987. So we had one, basically, in 1987. And we're now talking about knowing them all by 2020, which is an extraordinary achievement uh, for the human race. Absolutely amazing. And we, last year, well, starting the first of January this year, we were awarded a two and a half million dollar grant by the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council to keep looking for these uh, genetic causes of, of muscle and other disorders. And eight months into the project, we've got nine more new disease genes in the pipeline. So I'm getting pretty confident that the Erdert goal of knowing all these disease genes by 2020 might actually be achieved by all of us around the world who are working in this area. Okay. Next generation sequencing not only helps you find uh, disease genes, it helps you with diagnostics. So if a patient comes to see a neurologist, the neurologist wonders what the disease is. Uh, frequently it's genetic. So now with the next generation sequencing, we can sequence up to 500 genes in 24 patients in less than a day. And I've got the privilege of working both in the Perkins building and the Path West building uh, next door. So the research labs in here and the diagnostic labs in here, effectively known as the red blood cell building. You probably saw it on the way in. It's covered in red blood cells. For those of us who work in genetics, we hate that 
because red blood cells are the only cells we have that don't have any DNA. Why would you do that? You know? There's an entire floor in here devoted to genetics, <laughs> and there's no DNA on the outside. <clears throat> okay. So in Path West, uh, it's, our lab in there is the National Referral Center for Diagnosis of uh, Neurogenetic Disorders, and we receive over 2,000 samples a year from all around the country to analyze there. Right. The last thing I want to talk about is preventing genetic disease, which is something that's close to my heart. So if we look at the Turkish KLHL40 family, the one where we started off to find the gene, this is their amazing family tree, right? So the Turkish clinicians didn't just send us DNA samples from the two kids and the mum and dad. They sent us DNA samples from 22 other members of the family, all right? And you can follow the mutation. So these two kids down the bottom have got two copies of the mutation, the plus plus. Their mom and dad are carriers. The grandfather here's a carrier. The grandfather's there a carrier. This great grandfather doesn't have it, so it must have come from great grandmother, right? And then gone down through the pedigree. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sibs there don't have the mutation. They're not at risk of having a child with this terrible disease, all right? If you look carefully, the only couple that's at risk of having affected kids are these two here at the bottom of the pedigree, and they did have two affected children. They got pregnant again. While they were pregnant, we analyzed, well, they got their, their unborn child analyzed in Turkey, and the, the kid was born, and they sent us a picture of their newborn boy and thanked us and said, that was the first time they'd known that one of their unborn kids was going to be free of the family disease. All right? And that's a great feeding. For that family where we know what the condition is, we can uh, help them avoid having further affected kids. All right, brief talk about autosomal recessive disease. Sorry. Far right. Oh. I think my eyes were shut, Carolyn. All right, so recessive disease. Mum and dad are carriers, and one in, one in four of, of the children will be affected with recessive disease. As I say, genetics affects us all. The numbers are that each of us is carrying between three to five lethal recessive diseases. So if by chance we have a, a, our, you know, what's it, alternative, our, our, our life partner also is carrying a, a recessive mutation in those genes, the chance is that one in four of our kids will be affected. One in 40 human beings basically is a carrier of spinal muscular atrophy. This is a disease where the nerve cells in your spinal cord that make your muscles move die and disappear. And the most severe form, uh, kids are born again totally paralyzed. And of course, one in 22 Caucasians uh, is a carrier of cystic fibrosis. The numbers for Western Australia are that basically half of uh, infant mortality before age one is caused by rare diseases, most of which are genetic. So in other words, ge genetic disease is responsible for a large proportion of the infant mortality in our country. Okay, a couple of uh, descriptions of severe uh, recessive disease. Tay-Sachs disease, it's a recessive disease that affects the brain, which is common in the Ashkenazi population, but also exists in all the other populations. It usually results in death by age five. And I was sent this email by Edwin Kirk, clinical geneticist in Sydney, not so long ago, where he has got to the point that he wants to see prevention of genetic disease as much as possible. He's fed up with seeing kids uh, pass away with these severe genetic conditions. And so making genetic disease go away, you do this part of prevention. And the way to do that is preconception carrier screening. So that's finding the carriers of recessive diseases uh, 
before they find out their car is by having an affected child. And Australia is way, way, way behind world's best practice in relation to preconception carrier screening. The best country in the world at preconception carrier screening is Israel, and they have these massive nationwide program where they find the carriers before they have uh, affected kids. And one of the conditions that they screen for is the spinal muscular atrophy I talked to you about. And when I was in uh, International Congress of Neuromuscular Diseases in Nice in France last year, my old mate, a pediatric neurologist from Israel, Yoram Nevo, said they've got so little spinal muscular atrophy in Israel now, it's hard for them to take part in international clinical trials, which from my point of view is an amazing achievement and something that the rest of the world should maybe consider trying to emulate. All right, so summary, finding muscle genes. I wonder if we'll have ones this time and twos and threes or whether it'll just be ones all the way. Allows accurate diagnosis, allows couples to avoid having further affected children. As one of my colleagues says, it restores reproductive confidence. And preconception carrier screening has the potential to prevent a large proportion of the infant mortality and morbidity in our society. And I've got an amazing team in this building, an amazing team in the Pathways building next door. And we have the uh, central sequencing facility in WA. And I get funding for an awful lot of different resources. And I want to finish with this picture. All right? So this is a drawing by a Turkish girl, teenager. Here she is in her wheelchair down the bottom. And she's working in the laboratory to find the cure where these workmen can repair the mutation in her DNA and make her well. I think that's an extraordinary picture. And so thank you, and I can ask the questions.